Next session is with Liv Matan, who will be speaking on one click, six services, abusing the dangerous multi-service orchestration pattern. And this session is sponsored by Kavera. Kavera provides a purpose-built proxy for cloud APIs that enables preventative guardrails and data perimeters. Unlike other solutions, Kavera gives you granular parameter level controls with 100% support across every AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure service. Prevent insecure resource configurations, stop data exfiltration, and simplify cloud compliance. Kavera. Thank you, Liv. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk, One Click, Six Services. Cloud providers often build their services on top of each other. It creates an effect like a Jenga tower, where when one service could fall or get attacked, the other ones are prone to be impacted as well. On my research, I focused on GCP as an example and a case study, but I have more researchers that I can talk about them right now that shows this concept affects all of the major cloud providers and is a real threat. Have you ever pondered with the question of what the hell is going on when you create a cloud service in a major cloud provider? So I had with GCP, with, G, with GCP cloud functions, and I created a cloud function, then I inspected the logs to then see an odd cloud build trigger in my account. This cloud build was initiated by the cloud function I just created. And turns out that not only a cloud build was created, also a storage bucket, an artifact registry, or a container registry, and possibly event arc triggers and a cloud run service. All of these services were created behind the scenes by the cloud provider when I created just one cloud function in my GCP account. So I am Liv Mutan, a senior security researcher at Tenable. I was Microsoft's most valuable researcher at 2023, and I'm hunting the major CSPs for vulnerabilities as a part of the Tenable research team. So if we think about it and dive deeply inside what's going on behind the scenes, we can say that behind every service that you see on the screen that was created behind the scenes as a part of the functions deployment process, there is more IAM that you might get wrong, and it creates us as an attackers to a lot of attack paths and privilege escalation scenarios where we can explore, or as defenders for more risks and worries that we need to worry from. For example, an attacker who has access to a cloud run service, and this cloud run service by default has access to an artifact registry or a container registry, and those services include the images of the cloud functions. So I will dive deep more into this scenario, but this scenario is just one example of a privilege escalation that you can do uh, as a result of this concept. But how does this magic happen? How does these services interact with each other? We can assume they interact with each other with service accounts or the equivalent in AWS roles or managed identities in Azure. But in this case, they communicate with service agents. Service agents are Google Cloud services, uh, are Google managed service accounts that sit in Google's project. They are managed, and you cannot access them, but you can edit them. You can edit and add roles to those service agents. This is the Cloud Function Service Agent, and we now can know or assume that the Cloud Function Service Agent is the identity that was responsible for creating all of those resources that you saw on the previous slide. And moreover, to the ones of you that are not familiar with service agents in GCP, the equivalent in AWS is service linked roles or a Microsoft control managed identity. It means that it's a managed identity that is in a Microsoft uh, managed tenant. So we can get into the com concept of better performance leads to more complexity and it leads to more risks. The cloud providers are constantly trying to empower their services to make them more usable and improve usability but it leads to more complexity. For example, welcome second-gen cloud functions. Second-gen cloud functions allow for larger instance size, improved concurrency, and a lot of benefits. But 
GCP also included into the mix those two services, Cloud Run and EventArc, and it makes the scenario much more, much more complex. Now someone needs to uh, secure this process of the services communicating with each other. So to sum up, there is first gen cloud function and second gen cloud function. First gen cloud functions includes in the process behind the scenes for services, and you can choose between artifact registry or container registry. And in the second gen cloud functions, GCP also included into the mix event arc triggers and cloud run. And at the end of the day, when you create just one cl cloud function in your account, the GCP behind the scenes creates five more services in your account. So let's dive in into the function deployment flow. First, I create a cloud function. And as we saw behind the scenes, the cloud function service agent is working to create those resources in my account. The bucket is obviously is there to store my function's code. The artifact registry is there to store my function's image. The cloud build is there to build the image to then push it to the artifact registry. And the cloud run is the runtime environment for the cloud function. Now let's focus on the cloud build instance because this can be complicated, but I want you to focus on this one because it's interesting for the next slide. So the cloud build instance is packing all the dependencies and the stuff that is required for the image to be then pushed to the artifact registry. But how does he do it? He does it with the cloud build default service account that GCP attached to the cloud build instance they deployed in my account. GCP attached this default service account to allow, the, to allow the cloud build to push the image to the artifact registry because it needs permissions. Allow me to introduce you to a new privilege escalation vulnerability I discovered as a result of this process, confused function. It allows an identity with, an, a, permission, with a permission to update or create a new cloud function to escalate privileges to, the, to, to this default cloud build service account you saw on the screen. It allows a lot, of highly, uh, a lot of highly permissive permissions like storage, artifact registry, and more and more permissions. So let's dive into it. I, as an attacker, will update, for example, a Node.js cloud function. And I will update the package.json file of this function because it is stored um, just like in the code of the function. Then this cloud function code is, uh, will be stored in a bucket. And the cloud build as a part of the function's deployment process will install the malicious dependency I just inserted with the permission of updating a cloud function. And you can guess where it goes now. The cloud build is attached with the cloud build default service account with the permissions I want as an attacker, and I can access the IMDS and exfiltrate this cloud build default service account with the code that I ran on this instant with the malicious, well, on this instance with the malicious dependency I just inserted. So to sum up, I uploaded a malicious dependency to NPM, to the NPM registry. I specified this dependency with the permission to update a cloud function in the package.json, and as a part of the function's deployment process, the cloud build instance will install this dependency. So this is a complicated scenario, because how would one fix this? This is hard to fix. This architecture requires these high permissions. The CloudBind instance is, required, is requiring these permissions to push the image and to also pull the code from the bucket. And the, problem, the problematic scenario here is that GCP used the default service account in the function's deployment process instead of a custom one. And we all know that defaults are dangerous. The fix that GCP proposed and uh, deployed after we reported the vulnerability and awarded a bounty for it is to allow users to choose a custom service account for the cloud build instance that is deployed as a part of the function deployment process. So now when you create a cloud function in GCP, you can choose two service accounts, one from the run for the runtime environment and the second one for the cloud build instance that is deployed behind the scenes as a part of the function's deployment process. Also, GCP decided to choose the Compute Engine service account as a new default for new cloud builds. And when I say new, you can assume that old cloud builds are still vulnerable. And the Compute Engine service account is something to discuss about in the next slide. 
uh, GCP enforced the disablance of the default service account in Cloud Build with a new organization policy that is now by default is disabling this now legacy Cloud Build default service account. So let's talk about the fix. As I said, there are minimum permissions required for this architecture to work for the cloud function to actually be deployed. So this is still dangerous. The vulnerability still lives to some extent if you want your cloud functions to work. For example, uh, the permission of storage object admin is required on the custom service account that the user will choose. Also, the compute, compute engine default service account is notorious for being overprivileged. It has a lot of permissions you can abuse. Let's talk a little bit about the security architecture of AWS Lambda with buckets. So we saw GCP that they stored the code on um, the bucket of the user in my account. But AWS, as opposed, is storing the code in an AWS managed S3 bucket. And it puts the responsibility more on the cloud provider side rather than my responsibility if we talk about the shared responsibility model. And if we expand our research to the bigger picture of privilege escalations and dive deep more into the privilege escalations um, we can inspect, we can get into some interesting stuff. For example, Cloud Run access privilege escalation. An attacker who has access to Cloud Run as a part of the function's deployment process, then the Cloud Run by default is pulling an image, the function's image, from the artifact or container registry. And it also does it by the cloud function service agent. Guess what? Again, I saw it by proxying the requests and inspecting and seeing that the cloud run is deployed by the GCF admin robot, which stands for the cloud function service agent. So guess what we can do now? As an attacker, I have access to a Cloud Run service, but I can abuse the Cloud Function service agent that is doing the work for me to pull any function's image. So as an attacker, I can pull not only any function's image that I don't have access to, I only have access to the Cloud Run service, I can pull any image without permission for the account. Yes, if I don't have read permissions to know the name of the artifact registry image, then it will be kind of complicated, but I can guess, and there are a lot of ways to guess the image name to then pull it without any permission. I only have permission to Cloud Run, and I can pull any image for the ad from the artifact registry or the container registry by abusing this process. This is how it looks like. I deploy a Cloud Run. I can choose any container image from the artifact registry or the container registry and have fun with the privilege escalation. Moreover, sorry, moreover, uh, storage access privilege escalation. We saw that the minimum permissions, one of the minimum permissions required for the custom uh, service account as after the fix the GCP deployed is storage admin. And with storage admin, we can do a lot of nasty stuff. For example, an attacker who has access to a storage bucket, and this storage bucket holds the cloud functions code. This code can store secrets or vulnerable code that the attacker can exploit. And moreover, as a storage admin, maybe you can write stuff to the bucket in order to get RCE. For example, buckets in GCP store a lot of compute services code that attackers can abuse. So let's wrap up by speaking about vulnerability patterns in the cloud. One click in the console results in the CSP configuring a vulnerable deployment to the user. We saw it in the GCP case, but this is not the only case that we have in the research team. GCP, in this case, deployed the default uh, cloud build service account that uh, deployed a dangerous defaults that allowed for the privilege escalation and a lot of other um, risky stuff. And even the cloud providers get it wrong sometimes. GCP uh, always recommends to not use defaults, but in this time, they use the defaults as the default um, cloud functions deployment. And I'm not saying GCP is wrong here. GCP uh, worked with us uh, in a collaborative manner, and we reported the vulnerability, and they did a lot of changes to fix and um, improve the issue. 
As for the shared responsibility, this is some interesting stuff here because GCP and other cloud providers in this concept I showed you are deploying stuff in my account. It means that I have visibility to these resources. I can see those, I can remove those, edit those, and such. But it all happens behind the scenes. So it's a bit tricky because I, as a user or a researcher, need to inspect the logs or do some more deeper stuff in order to know that when I create one cloud function, there are six services <laughs> that are created in my account as a result of this process. And for that exact reason, I'm going to present you a tool that me and my team are going to make open source in just a couple of days so you can use it. Um, it analyzes all the write, uh, includes creation logs and identity made. It recursively checks for write logs and gets new created services. And I'm going to demo it. I'm going to give a props to my teammate Noham Dahan that wrote the tool um, after the idea I had uh, as a result from this concept. And let's do a quick demo and hope the hotel's Wi-Fi is not going to kill my presentation. OK, so as you can see, uh, it's called Genganizer. I'm going to specify my username, my profile name, region, and I'm going to specify time start and time end, uh, and depth. Depth means I'm going to run it and show you. So these are all the services that were created. And I gave an example in this case of a creation of a CloudFormation stack. Just for the case, just for the sake of uh, presenting the example, obviously this is not uh, a service that is good for the example uh, for attacker's perspective or any other research perspective, because this is the nature and natural behavior of the service. Uh, so the CloudFormation service in this case created an EC2, and if we go down one more level of depth, we can also see that those, one of those EC2s created a shared snapshot volume. So the depth taking is taking all those services from the first run and looking for the invoked by field to then recursively check for more services that were created as a part of this process. So we have three uh, levels of depth you can check. Uh, it's good for researchers to find more services created as a part of creation of services, or for defenders to know where they can be, uh, where they can fall or might be attacked. As for GCP, uh, right now the tool is only working on AWS. We're going to expand it to GCP and Azure. But as for GCP, for now you can use this query to manual, manually check for services created after the creation of a service. For example, in Cloud Function, I use this query uh, in order to find the Cloud Build and GCS bucket that was created as a part of the function's deployment process. Thank you, everyone. Any questions? Any questions for, for Liv? Yeah, great talk. Um, is Thank any you. of it ephemeral? Like, so it lives for the time where it's creating the service and running all the deployment scripts. Does it then, does any of it like kind of self clean up or go away afterwards so that it no longer presents an attack surface or does this stuff persist throughout the life cycle of the service? Great question. Uh, this stuff persists. These are resources that are created in your account, and they are there for the functions deployment process. Uh, I assume they are still there and are not deleted, because if you want to update the functions code, a deployment will need to, to be run again. So the resources are there to stay. Right. Additional questions for Liv? I have a question for you. In terms of the, so you showed us the query that we can run to see what has been created. Were there additional logs that you had to turn on to make that happen, or was it just default logs will show? It was default logs in Logs Explorer. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Liv. Appreciate that presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thank you.